Hey Ninth to Know, I'm Dawson Kratzer, back with another brief devotion for busy people. Today we're going to be in the book of Ezekiel. Turn to the middle of your Bible, you'll find Psalms, after that later on Isaiah, and then you'll find Ezekiel, one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And today we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 18. In here, there's a verse that's often taken out of context, so let's correct the context today if you don't mind. Chapter 18 starts, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? Is this the inspiration for John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath? No one knows. Possibly, but who knows? Whatever the case, this is a common proverb that Israel was using, and the meaning behind it didn't have anything to do with actually eating grapes that weren't good. Uh, but what it meant was, you're eating these grapes, you're committing these sins, these sour grapes, and as a result, your children are tarnished. And this is actually a major sticking point in the early 20th century with a guy named E.Y. Mullins, who happened to be the president of a seminary not far from here. And this is one of the texts that influenced him when it came to the idea of what was called soul autonomy. This was a new theological term, but an old theological concept that had been around for a long time. And the idea is that each individual is responsible for their own faith. The sins of a father cannot carry down, and the faith of a father cannot carry down to his children. And this passage really enlightens us to that, that this is not just a New Testament idea, but as all theology is, it's a Bible idea. And so let's look at the different breaks uh, here in Ezekiel chapter 18. You'll see in verse 5, But if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness, and does not eat at the mountain shrines, or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, or defile his neighbor's wife. And he goes on with a continuing list. Read these when you have time in your own devotions. But what you'll notice is, it's saying if a man is righteous and does the right things, that doesn't guarantee faith for his children. That is not how the spiritual economy works. The, the faith economy isn't you're guaranteeing your future progeny faith just because of your own faithfulness. That's not how it works. Then you jump down to verse 10. Then he may have a so violent son who sheds blood and who does any of these things to a brother. Well, conversely, if your son is sinful, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a bad father. It doesn't mean that you're not a faithful father when it comes to your own personal faith. Now, it could mean that you had some failures along the way. It could mean that you could have parented differently. It could mean that you were too hard in the, in the things you shouldn't have been hard in and too lenient in the things that you should have been dealing more swiftly with. But it doesn't mean that you're faithless as a result. It just means that your son has their own individual faith and it is not tied to yours. Jumping down to verse 14. Now, behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins which he has committed. So now the father in this example, not good. Son is good. And observing does not do likewise. The son doesn't do what his father does. In the same way, the father doesn't tarnish his son in such a way that he is only bound for faithlessness. This comes from a bad theological understanding about Cain all the way back in the early chapters of Genesis. There were some Israelites who thought, we are cursed just like Cain. That is why we're in the situation that we're currently in, being devastated by our enemies. That's not how this works. You can choose faithfulness for yourself, no matter how your dad was. How encouraging is this for so many of our brothers and sisters who may not have had great households, whether they were believing households with great parents or unbelieving households with great parents. No matter the case, it doesn't matter who your parents are. Your faith is not defined by your childhood and your upbringing. It is something for you and your spiritual heavenly father to work out in your life. Finally, we move down to, chap to verse 19 of chapter 18. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity? When the son has practiced justice and righteousness and has observed all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. What great words. We're looking back even to the beginning of Genesis right here. Because listen, he shall surely die was the punishment for eating of the tree in the middle of the garden. And yet now he shall surely live. How? By practicing justice and righteousness. Ooh, but Romans reminds us 
None of us can practice justice and righteousness. There is but one who has done that, and our faith is in Christ, the perfect practicer of justice, the perfect practicer of righteousness. We need to look to him in our own lives. It's not that we can morally achieve faith in and of ourselves, but it is by his faith that our decisions in everyday life is influenced to be more like Christ, less like our former selves, and less like the world, the flesh, and the devil. Thanks so much for tuning in to this brief devotion for you, busy people.